Lauren Southern is known for her persistent defense of a traditional lifestyle. Basically, casual sex is bad, strict gender rules, religion, etc. are good. She makes this very clear in a number of videos, but in particular, I want to take a look at her video titled, Why Millennials Should Embrace Tradition. Lauren starts out the video by laying out her thesis. Traditions of the past were great, and all these hit millennials have abandoned them to try and make up for their boring personalities, which will lead to disaster and unhappiness. I'm sure many of us growing up remember the phrase, white picket fence and a dog named Spot. It was always used as a derogatory term for a lifestyle deemed ordinary, dull, and conventional. But before this hip generation came about, for a very long time, that idea was not derogatory at all, but in fact, a dream held by many people, and for good reason. People had that dream because the traditions displayed in it were, quite frankly, the best way to historically have a fulfilling life. But today, things have changed a bit. Being ordinary is just about the most horrific thing on the planet for hip millennials. So instead, we dye our hair, shave its sides, pierce our noses, riot in the streets, or join a cookie-cutter indie band to make up for our extraordinarily ordinary personalities. In fact, we're so afraid of what is deemed ordinary or conservative that being traditional is now kind of the unordinary. Being traditional may as well be the new punk. And at the moment, I'm hoping that punk makes a comeback because instead of finding meaning and freedom in our rejection of tradition, what we found and what we will find is a maze of confusion and unhappiness in it. Obviously, it's not worth making a video just responding to opinions. Anyone can respond to opinion. However, after laying out her thesis, Southern gives us something solid to work with. This isn't just my opinion, it's backed up by facts. You see, Lauren claims to have collected a multitude of studies and facts that support her traditional stance, so that'll be the focus of this video. Let's dig into the facts and studies that Lauren provides and see if they really do support her positions. Spoiler, they don't. First, Lauren provides a source to define happiness and the principal areas where you can derive it from. In Charles Murray's book, Coming Apart, he dedicates a whole chapter to what leads to a happy life. Now, he gives a pretty fair definition of the word happiness. He distinguishes it from fleeting pleasure and would define it as consisting of lasting and justified satisfaction with life as a whole. So no, you can't do a line of coke before I ask you if you're happy and then claim you're truly fulfilled. Happiness is linked to things we deem important and the effort we put into them. Murray lays out some of these things as family, vocation, community, and faith. I'm going to simply boil this down to tradition. I have to stop here to point out a rhetorical sleight of hand that Lauren pulls here. So Lauren cites a book, and this book claims that happiness is derived from family, vocation, community, and faith. Which is all fine and good, but then Lauren takes these four things and equates them to tradition which she then uses to justify all of the other values that Lauren puts in the tradition bucket, like strict gender roles and no sex before marriage. Here, take a look. Murray lays out some of these things as family, vocation, community, and faith. I'm going to simply boil this down to tradition. Now, let's look at the research. One thing we always link to tradition is gender roles, the feminine housewife and the masculine breadwinner. So does Charles Murray, Lauren Source, really think that gender roles like feminine housewives and masculine breadwinners are vital ingredients to happiness? Let's take a look at what his book actually says. Lauren cites chapter 15 in Murray's book, and it's called The Founding Virtues and the Stuff of Life, and Lauren says that Murray lays out some of these things as family, vocation, community, and faith. I'm going to simply boil this down to tradition. So Lauren presents the four things that Murray lays out as tradition, but what does the book actually say? From the book, let me put it formally. If we ask what are the domains through which human beings achieve deep satisfactions in life, achieve happiness, the answer is that there are just four, family, vocation, community, and faith. So Lauren is correct with presenting these four things as what Murray identifies as necessary for happiness, but is she right in saying that these things are synonymous to tradition? Let's keep reading. Family, vocation, community, and faith with these provisos. Community can embrace people who are scattered geographically. Vocation can include avocations or causes. So when Murray defines community, he doesn't limit it to a suburban type community between neighbors. He defines community as any amount of people who are connected in some way. 
even if they're scattered geographically. An obvious example of this would be online communities. If you like to talk about mechanical keyboards online with others, Murray says you're in a community. Murray also includes avocations and causes as part of what he calls vocations, with avocation being defined as a hobby or minor occupation. So if you're really into boating and video games, Murray says that's part of your vocation. Murray continues, It is not necessary for any individual to make use of all four domains, nor do I array them in a hierarchy. I merely assert that these four are all there are. The stuff of life occurs within those four domains. So to sum up, Murray thinks that the domains of happiness are family, which is kind of redundant since family fits into his definition of community, which includes anyone that a person is connected to, geographically or not. Vocation, which includes everything that a person is actively interested in doing, including hobbies and causes. And faith, which fits into his definition of both community and vocation. So, is Lauren correct in saying that these things are equal to tradition? I don't think that necessarily follows. You could perfectly fit into Murray's four categories by being a single mother who engages in environmental activism and does yoga with her activist friends and follows a new age system of spirituality. So, I think we're already off to a bad start. But anyway, Lauren is going to use her cursory interpretation of these four categories to justify what she thinks is the ideal lifestyle, starting with gender roles. Now, let's look at the research. One thing we always link to tradition is gender roles, the feminine housewife and the masculine breadwinner. But what does this do for our happiness? Well, in GSS surveys highlighted in Murray's book, housewives or stay-at-home moms reported the highest happiness out of anyone in any vocation. So Lauren is right. In the survey data that Murray presents in his book, housewives are the highest proportion of people who are highly satisfied with their work. And I don't doubt this for a second. Most people who have children feel highly fulfilled when spending time with them and raising them. However, the picture is a bit more complicated than that. You see, Murray only examined which occupations were the happiest by proportion. He didn't examine the trends. Another study conducted last year with more recent data from the GSS the same source that Murray cited, examines the trends that this data shows. What they found was that while housewives were indeed the happiest occupation, this is changing in that housewives are steadily becoming less happy while women with full-time jobs are becoming more happy and that women with full-time jobs are expected to become more happy than housewives if these trends continue. Interestingly, this study also found that the older that the women surveyed were, the happier they were as housewives. The researchers think that as culture changes and more women value achievement outside of family, that being a housewife may be seen as being undesirable. What else does Lauren cite? To expand on this, the American Sociological Review has also published a study showing that relationships with more egalitarian gender roles were tied to lower marital and sexual satisfaction for women. So Lauren cites an article here called, Recent Studies Prove Traditional Gender Roles Bring Greatest Happiness. With the introduction, many feminists argue that having different defined marriage roles for men and women is oppressive because it contradicts certain abstract principles that men and women must be exactly the same in every way. The article then cites two studies, which are the studies that Lauren mentioned. The first study is called Egalitarianism, Housework, and Sexual Frequency in Marriage by the American Sociological Association. And the second one is called Benevolent Sexism and Support of Romantic Partners' Goals undermining women's competence while fulfilling men's intimacy needs. Let's start by going over the former. When talking about this study, Lauren has this to say. To expand on this, the American Sociological Review has also published a study showing that relationships with more egalitarian gender roles were tied to lower marital and sexual satisfaction for women. So Lauren is right about the result that these researchers found, that married couples who stick to traditional gender roles have more sex. There are several aspects of this study that I don't think support Lauren's conclusion, but first we'll go over the study itself. Now the researchers in this study tested two competing theories to explain sexual frequencies in marriage with respect to how they relate to gender roles, which is sexual exchange and sexual scripts. The first theory they tested was exchange theory, where sex was hypothesized to be a sort of resource that couples traded in, which the woman possessed and the man wanted. If this theory is correct, it's thought that more egalitarian marriages would have more sex because then the woman would 
treat the husband to more sex as reward for more housework. So a word of warning, this next part is a little wordy, but it's necessary to understand what this study is really talking about, and whether or not it really supports Lauren's conclusions. The other theory that they tested was that of sexual scripts. The researchers make it clear that little work has been done on the topic of sexual scripts, but the idea of sexual scripting suggests that women's and men's sexual activity is governed by internalized cultural scripts. For example, among teens, sexual scripts are highly gendered and link sexual activity to masculinity and femininity. Other research finds that men experience greater sexual dysfunction when their partners spend more time with the men's friends than men do themselves, suggesting that behaviors that threaten men's independence and masculinity lead to greater sexual dysfunction. In this study, the researchers assume that internalized dominant cultural scripts govern sexual behavior, although interpersonal and intrapsychic scripts may also structure sexual behavior in marriage, meaning any sexual scripts that individuals have created apart from those that they got from the society around them. So how do these scripts work? For intercourse to occur, a script must exist that defines a situation as sexual. Scripts specify when, why, and how individuals should act sexually. As a simple example of a script, intercourse typically takes place in a series of relatively tightly delineated stages, moving from kissing to fondling and then to coitus. In other words, scripts are the sexual etiquette for a given culture. I think it would take too long to explain it all here, so unlike Lauren, I'll link the study in the description for you to read yourself, but in this study, the researchers concluded that the sexual script theory, not the cultural exchange theory, explained the mechanics of sexual frequency in marriage. However, due to the cultural aspect of sexual scripts, the researchers had this conclusion from the study. The notion that sex within marriage is bound to traditional sexual scripts does not necessarily put egalitarianism at odds with sexual frequency. Rather, the saliency of traditional sexual scripts suggests that if maintaining certain features of marriage, such as sexual frequency, is desired, increased egalitarianism in one area of marriage must be paired with comparable shifts away from traditional gender behaviors, attitudes, and scripts in others. One potential change may be women's sexual agency. As we noted before, Baumeister and colleagues document substantial differences in sexual interest and activity between men and women, reflecting double standards that penalize girls and young women for sexual activity while often rewarding sexually active young men. To the extent that these double standards become internalized, heterosexual women may subjugate their own desires and may not feel as free to initiate sex. They're talking about slut-shaming here. One potential interpretation of our results is that husbands' participation in core housework increases their stress levels and makes them less likely to initiate sex. If wives do not feel empowered to initiate sex, then husbands' housework and ensuing fatigue would reduce the frequency of intercourse. So this is where it gets really relevant. In this interpretation, it is not necessarily the case that egalitarianism in household labor is incompatible with sexual activity itself but rather that egalitarianism is incompatible with current sexual scripts. Gendered sexual scripts punish women for being sexually agenic and encourage men to be sexual initiators. If these scripts were to change in both men and women initiated intercourse, then the division of household labor would presumably be less consequential. You see, using this study to defend the benefits of traditional gender roles is defending a self-fulfilling prophecy. The researchers in this study concluded that if women were allowed to feel less stigmatized for desiring and initiating sex due to traditional gender roles, marriages wherein the husband had more housework would have more sex due to the woman being empowered to initiate sex when the man wouldn't. Also, while sex is an important part of a marriage, it's far from the only part of marriage. I mean, no matter how steamy your relationship is, the amount of time you spend in your partner's genital areas is very low compared to the rest of the relationship. And guess what? The same study that Lauren cites in defense of traditional marriages versus more egalitarian marriages explicitly says in the beginning of the study that egalitarian marriages statistically do better in ways other than how often they have sex. Research shows that when men do more housework, Wives' perceptions of fairness and marital satisfaction tend to rise, and couples experience less marital conflict. Other research shows that U.S. couples who have more equal divisions of labor are less likely to divorce 
Then our couples where one partner specializes in breadwinning and the other partner specializes in family work. So this study cited a study that says that egalitarian couples have less conflict, one study that says they're less likely to divorce, and two studies that say that egalitarian marriages leave their wives feeling more satisfied in the marriage. Remember, I didn't go out and look for these studies. This is in Lauren's own citation. So based on Lauren's citation, are traditional gender roles the key to a happy marriage? It doesn't look like it. Now, on to the next study. This study is called Benevolent Sexism and Support of Romantic Partners' Goals, Undermining Women's Competence While Fulfilling Men's Intimacy Needs. Let's go over what Lauren says about this study. And research from psychologists in New Zealand found that a man's level of benevolent sexism was directly correlated with his overall life satisfaction, and that women are happier in relationships with these sexist men. So in this study, the researchers asked a hundred heterosexual couples questions that gauged their levels of benevolent sexism with questions like, women should be cherished and protected by men, and hostile sexism with questions like, women seek to gain power by getting control over men. They asked about their relationship quality with questions like, how close is your relationship? All of these questions could be answered on a scale from 1 to 7. After participants answered these questions, they were asked more questions about how they felt about their goal-related competence by asking, to what extent do you feel the following in regard to your goal? Capable and effective, like a competent person, confident I can achieve my goal, and inadequate or incompetent. They were asked about perceived regard and intimacy by reporting to what extent that they felt, quote, close and intimate, understood and validated, and accepted and valued, unquote. Finally, to make sure that the effects of sexist attitudes were not due to recipients desiring different levels of support, recipients of support also answered to what extent they wanted their partner to offer suggestions and advice on how to achieve their goals and be warm and affectionate towards them. Now, in this study, men who rated the highest in benevolent sexism were the most likely to offer what was called dependence-oriented support. And pay attention to this next part. And the recipients of this dependence-oriented support felt less competent towards their goals, and they felt lower amounts of regard and intimacy in their relationships. Also, interestingly, the study found that levels of benevolent sexism and hostile sexism were positively correlated with one another. Funny Lauren doesn't mention that. Now, when it came to the effect of women's benevolent sexist attitudes and their effect on men, women who more strongly endorsed benevolent sexism exhibited greater relationship-oriented support, while men who more strongly endorsed benevolent sexism provided lower levels of relationship-oriented support, and men in relationships with women who endorsed benevolent sexism felt more regard and intimacy in the relationship, hence the title of this study. Benevolent Sexism in Support of Romantic Partners' Goals, Undermining Women's Competence While Fulfilling Men's Intimacy Needs. You can further add to that title, Undermining Women's Intimacy, too. The study concludes with, Benevolent sexism prescribes that men should protect and cherish women, and is proposed to have two key functions, reducing women's ability to challenge men's power while also facilitating men's access to close, intimate relationships with women. The current study demonstrated how these two functions are realized in intimate relationships via the types of support men and women provide in the context of their partner's personal goal pursuits. Men who endorsed benevolent sexism provided more dependency-oriented support, including directly providing plans and solutions and neglecting the recipient's own abilities, which led to their female partner to feel less competent. In contrast, women who endorse benevolent sexism provided greater relationship-oriented support, characterized by affection and emphasizing the positive relationship outcomes that the recipient's goals will have, which led their male partner to perceive greater positive regard and intimacy in their relationship. This research provides the first demonstration that, even within intimate contexts, benevolent sexism functions to undermine the support women receive for their own independent pursuits, while encouraging the fulfillment of men's intimacy needs. So Lauren Southern read this study, if she actually read it at all, and saw that benevolent sexism made men perceive more intimacy, skipped over the parts where benevolent sexism adversely made women feel less competent about themselves and less intimacy in regard to relationships, and she just went ahead and said, see, this proves that traditional gender roles are great. 
Once again, this is in the study that Lauren cited herself, and even worse, it's right there in the video. You can see right here where it says, Men who endorse benevolent sexism provided more dependency-oriented support, including directly providing plans and solutions and neglecting the recipient's own abilities, which led to their female partners feeling less competent and less positively regarded. Did they just miss that, or did, you, did they just not care? Also, one last thing about this study. Lauren said, Women are happier in relationships with these sexist men. The study didn't say that women in these sexist relationships were more happy than women in more egalitarian relationships. It, it doesn't say that anywhere at all. I'll link the study for you to read for yourself in the description. After presenting her two studies, Lauren presents her bit on gender in biology. Despite popular belief, biology does not stop at the neck. Of course men and women are different, and of course different things are going to make them happy. So I agree that men and women are different, but when you say that men and women are different in the context of defending traditional gender roles and so-called benevolent sexism, I think you're making a different kind of claim. I think that Lauren's actual point is to say that men and women are different in a way that biologically justifies these traditional attitudes. And I'm not the first to make this point, but if Lauren is really correct about that, she shouldn't have to make that statement. The whole segment she just presented wouldn't be necessary in the slightest. If gender roles and sexism were these immutable aspects of our biology, there would be no need to defend them, because that would be like defending the need to eat or breathe. But instead, Lauren needs to convince people to act a certain way, not because that's how they need to act, but because that's how she wants them to act. And if she can convince you that you're somehow biologically wired to act in the way she wants you to, that would help her case. Let's keep going. But what about another concept, like marriage and the nuclear family? Based on many studies, marriage itself is the most reliable happiness indicator. So while some people may have an awful experience, finding lasting deep satisfaction is likely worth that coin toss for a lot of people. Pew Research has even shown that 43% of married respondents said they were very happy compared to 24% of unmarried individuals. And when kids enter the picture, millennial men get even more happy and fulfilled. There's also a few extra benefits to this. Married people tend to earn more money, live longer, and according to the CDC, have an overall better health. So I can only speak for myself, but as a progressive, I don't really have any objection to this segment. By all means, if you meet the right person, if you two love each other, and you're not being pressured to do so, marry them and be happy. However, I'll point out that in the context of a video extolling the virtues of tradition, that heterosexual monogamous marriage being the norm is a relatively recent phenomenon in human history. I mean, the most common form of marriage in the Holy Bible, the cornerstone of traditional Western faith, is polygamy. Also, gay marriage was just legalized here in the States, and that was a massive break from tradition, and it only came at the tail end of progressives fighting for decades against religious conservatives to get that right. If being a conservative is about doing what statistically makes you more happy and not just arbitrarily defending traditions for the sake of tradition, all of that struggle wouldn't have been necessary in this wonderful source of happiness that you're promoting, Lauren. Marriage should have been available to everyone this whole time. Next, Lauren is going to talk about being a slut. Now, one of the biggest taboos in traditional lifestyle is being a slut. We've all gotten a lecture from our parents, grandparents, or some old man on Fox News waving their finger at us saying promiscuity only leads to bad things. But recent popular media like Vice, BuzzFeed, and Cosmo want you to embrace your sexuality and freedom. Have fun while you're young. But who's right? Is there merit to that old age tale? Well, I'm sorry to ruin this for you too, but yes, there is. Keep in mind the distinction between sex within a romantic relationship and recurring casual sex. We're not talking about star-crossed lovers here, we're talking about the chick or bro that is the neighborhood bicycle. Now instead of empowering these people, I think we should look at what the research says. People who are promiscuous are more likely to suffer from depression. And for women, random sexual behavior like having sex with a stranger at a club is according to researchers linked to disorders like psychosis, manic episodes, substance abuse and dependency, disassociative identity disorder, as well as borderline narcissistic and antisocial personalities. In fact, it can be partially diagnostic of such pathological conditions. Being a slut can be a symptom of far worse issues. 
I think it's strange that Lauren would present this as an argument against being a quote-unquote slut. As Lauren herself said, sexual promiscuity is a symptom of these mental disorders, not a cause of it. This is like making a big deal out of drug use because people with PTSD are more likely to be dependent on drugs. I mean, from my perspective, I would be worried about solving the root issue, like the PTSD instead of the drug use. As for people who are simply sluts outside of having a disorder, well, they can be impacted by psychological and medical consequences as well. Of course, you increase your chances of unwanted pregnancy and risks of getting a sexually transmitted disease with multiple or many partners. This is why progressives want to have comprehensive sex education as a standard in public education. Research and studies consistently show that abstinence-only sex education leads to higher amount of teen pregnancies and STDs, and Texas, a state with an abstinence-only sex ed program, has attained the dubious honor of being the state with the highest rate of repeat teen pregnancies. And why do people still defend abstinence-only sex ed? Well, out of tradition, of course. The government can't even teach our kids to read, write, and do math. You know, now, well, look, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I go to church, I'm a Catholic, a lot of these values contradict the values I'm teaching to my kids at home. What right does a school district that can't even teach kids to read and write, and this is generally speaking around the country, have to impose their values on the kids? Sean, this is the report right here. 62 pages. I have read every single word. And I've got to tell you something. Jack and Jill go up the hill, and they do some really inappropriate things once they get they're up not, there. They're not fetching a pail of water uh, No, anymore? sir, they are not. Uh, right. I had a chance to talk to the superintendent. I don't even want to hear about Humpty Dumpty if that's the case, but go ahead. Rub-a-dub-dub, three-minute tub. Then, of course, there's research showing that people who have had more sexual partners are less happy within their marriages, especially women. The old lecturing church fogies win again this time. So the study that Lauren cites does indeed say what she says it does. However, it doesn't offer an explanation why, only that people who've had more sex before marriage are more likely to divorce. The study does offer a possible explanation, however. So one reason why this might be the case is that people who have been in more relationships know how to better gauge the quality of their relationships, and they're more aware of when they are in a bad relationship. But isn't this a good thing? Isn't it a good thing that people have more information on how to live their lives better? After all, Lauren said it herself in this video. Now, I'm a big fan of freedom, but I don't want to go into anything without being educated about it first. So, by the same logic, Lauren should be in favor of people having more relationships to better understand how they work and whether or not they're good for them, right? Also, if having more sex before marriage just made you a worse marriage partner, the divorce rate to partners before marriage should be roughly one to one, right? Well, the Institute for Family Studies did a study on this, and what they found was in their own words, unintuitive. Generally, people with more sexual partners do have more divorces, with people having over 10 sexual partners before marriage doing the worst. But then, people who've had 6 to 9 sex partners should be the second worst, right? Nope, the second worst divorce rate was with people who've had just 2 sexual partners, so... Again, Lauren has a correlation and causation problem here, and boiling it all down to people who just need to follow tradition isn't helping. We're almost done now, and Lauren is going to present what I think is her strangest point. There's an unbelievable link between community and happiness. Back in my old province of British Columbia, the government of Victoria did a happiness index partnership. And what did they find? Well, their community's high levels of well-being were linked to strong social relations and feelings of connectedness to their community. There are plenty of studies that back this up, showing that even the weakest ties to someone, like saying hello in the morning, impact our overall belongingness. The reason why I think this segment is strange is, do these points really have to be made? I mean, is there this whole millennial progressive trend of people attacking community and saying hi to people on walks? The article that Lauren cited didn't just talk about community efforts in Victoria, it also mentioned the country of Bhutan and the Himalayas and Seattle. However, I think the bigger point that Lauren is trying to make here is, big cities are bad and small communities are good. And the reason why I say this is because before her little segment here, she had this to say. Now, another one of these crazy little traditional images we have in our head along with the white picket fence and the stay-at-home mom is the community and the church. 
Good old Joe Smith goes down to the bakery, says good morning to old lady Susan, and meets his friend Bob to pick up a pie and get ready for the community barbecue. It sounds nerdy, it sounds old fashioned, but it made people freaking happy. I don't know about you, but I'm not particularly fond of my walks in the city where everyone gives you suspicious looks or stares at the ground with their headphones in. So as for the claim that small communities make people happier, I decided to do some research for Lauren and I found a study that tried to find out if people were happier in suburban communities or in city communities, and it had this to say from the study. Results show that people living in the suburbs are no more likely to express greater satisfaction with their neighborhood, greater satisfaction with the quality of their lives, or stronger feelings of self-efficacy than people living in the city. And well, that, that's just perfect, isn't it? So now... We've gotten to the point where Lauren is no longer presenting any studies and just giving her opinions on things. Although I said this wasn't worth responding to in the beginning, I'm going to do that anyway, just for fun. Now, these are just a few examples, but you'll find that the rest of the things that lead to happiness are classical, traditional things like hard work, honesty, and decency. Basically, picture the attitude of a pre-powers Captain America. Just a genuinely decent person. The old traditional vision of a man. The original Captain America, huh? So, I guess Lauren is on the side of punching Nazis then. Interesting. This lifestyle leads to happiness in love life, work life, and overall fulfillment. But don't take my word for it. Do the research yourself. Delve into this stuff. I just don't think people should go into life blind with these silly visions that all tradition is stuffy and for old people. I'm in total agreement. I'd like for you to go and do the research yourself, which is why in the description I've included links to the studies that Lauren mentioned that I've responded to. I just don't want anyone to go through life blindly following tradition because that's what someone on the internet told them to. What's scarier is we're not just ignoring these traditions, we're doing the complete opposite of them. Men are being taught to hate themselves for their gender, to serve and grovel to women and be weak when that doesn't make either gender happy and women are being taught to work nine to five, despise men and drink red wine every night until their ovaries dry up and then are surprised it leads to regret. Uh, who is saying this? As a progressive, I've never been told any of this and I'm pretty sure no one I know is being told this either. However, I can think of some pretty terrible messages that are being told to boys and girls that are coming from some very pro-tradition places. So your little son starts to act a little girlish when he's four years old, and instead of squashing that like a cockroach and saying, man up, son, get that dress off you and get outside and dig a ditch because that's what boys do. You get out the camera and you start taking pictures of Johnny acting like a female and then you upload it to YouTube and everybody laughs about it and next thing you know, this dude, this kid is acting out childhood fantasies that should have been squashed. The second you see your son dropping the limp wrist, you rock over there and crack that wrist. Man up. Give him a good punch. Okay? You're not going to act like that. You were made by God to be a male, and you're going to be a male. You say, can I take charge like that as a parent? Yeah, you can. You're authorized. I just gave you a special dispensation this morning to do that. And when your daughter starts acting too butch, you rein her in. And you say, oh, no. Oh, no, sweetheart. You can play sports. Play them. Play them to the glory of God. But sometimes you're going to act like a girl and walk like a girl and talk like a girl and smell like a girl. And that means you're going to be beautiful. You're going to be attractive. You're going to dress yourself up. If she wins, is it not, you're not happy about it at all, even though it'll be a woman president? Absolutely not. I don't believe there should be a woman president. Why not? I believe in Christianity. I see that she does not uh, stand for the Christianity. I... Does Christianity say you can't have a female president? No, you... It doesn't say. I just don't believe it should be women leaders. You think women should be more in the complimentary role? Yes, I do. I believe women should, you know, stand back from things like this, especially from the White House and to be speakers like this. For you dumb cunt, learn how to fucking play a proper character. 45 hours and you still suck. I guess girls just suck at video games in general, you fucking stupid whore. On the junk rat idea, Go back to the kitchen. This is the reason why girls should not do anything other than be a woman. Do not play Overwatch, you fat, ugly, pimple-ridden face whore. Women who choose the assholes will fucking end this race.
they will fucking end this human race if we don't start holding them a fucking countable. Women who choose assholes guarantee child abuse. Women who choose assholes guarantee criminality, sociopathy, politicians, all the cold-hearted jerks who run the world came out of the vaginas of women who married assholes. And I don't know how to make the world a better place without holding women accountable for choosing assholes. If asshole wasn't a great reproductive strategy, it would have been gone long ago. Women keep that black bastard flame alive. They cup their hands around it. They protect it with their bodies. They keep the evil of the species going by continually choosing these guys. If being an asshole didn't get women, there would be no assholes left. If women chose nice guys over assholes, we would have a glorious and peaceful world in one generation. Yeah. And there are plenty more positive things being stomped out of our lives. In high school, we had no duties, deadlines, or repercussions for terrible actions. We were all told we were special little snowflakes, regardless of work ethic. We were told by the media that lots and lots of sex is empowering. We were told in popular culture that traditional lifestyle is stuffy and boring. All these things that were deemed sacred before and gave life meaning have lost all of their meaning, making us undoubtedly lost along with them. We've jumped off the shoulders of giants in favor of our own supposedly inherent superior knowledge of the world. So you see what I mean? Like, how are you supposed to respond to something like this? I, I don't think these statements are meant to change anyone's mind. I think this is just Lauren's straw man version of progressivism that she expects all of her fans to have in their heads. So then she can summarily knock them down and make her fans feel good about themselves. Tradition typically exists for a reason. Sometimes it can be silly, I'll admit, very silly. But there are a lot of cases where it's simply tradition because these things are tried and true. They have been passed on as knowledge to later generations to help them out. Yes, just because there have been crazy traditions in the past doesn't mean we throw the baby out with the bathwater and just embrace deconstructionism. We need to get this idea out of our heads that our ancestors, grandparents, and parents don't want us to have fun when they suggest traditional behavior. In fact, us being happy and having fun is exactly what they want. But sometimes we don't know what will make us happy. There are lots of people who never find lasting happiness. And a lot of us will spend most of our lives trying to figure it out and we have no idea what the hell we're doing. But with the combined knowledge of research teams, psychologists, and our dear lecturing grandmothers, at least we have a small hand to guide us in the dark. Now, you make up your own mind about what you want to do with your life, but I think it's unfair to not have the information out there. Look into this stuff. And millennials, why not be different? Why not try embracing a bit of tradition? If you enjoyed that video and you want to see more, then make sure to hit the like button and subscribe. Yeah, no thank you. So we did what Lauren told us to do. We looked into it and it turns out she's wrong. There is one part of what she said that I agree with, which is that sometimes tradition is tradition because they worked. For example, traditions like cooking, exercise, storytelling, art, those are all great traditions. But if you're going to try and defend other traditions like strict gender roles, benevolent sexism which actually isn't so benevolent what to do with your body whether or not you should get married or where you should live you're going to be on some very shaky ground so i agree live the way you want but if you're looking for happiness don't make yourself live according to some very arbitrary and culturally manufactured traditions but don't dismiss them out of hand either what i think is truly the key to happiness is finding your purpose as in what you're going to contribute to the world, what you're going to leave behind, and structuring your life around that purpose. Now, how to find this purpose is a much, much bigger topic, and there are plenty of very smart and dedicated individuals who have researched and discussed this. But whatever your purpose is, you may find yourself going along with tradition or contradicting tradition. Whatever you do, let it be because it's right for you not because someone else or the culture around you pressured you into doing so. Also, one last thing. Remember that book that Lauren presented in the beginning? 
for her definition of happiness. In Charles Murray's book, Coming Apart, he dedicates a whole chapter to what leads to a happy life. Well, the book isn't actually called Coming Apart. It's called Coming Apart, The State of White America. And it's not about happiness. It's about how white America over the decades have split into an upper elite class and a lower class of poor whites. Only one chapter out of the 17 in the book is about happiness. Also, the book is by Charles Murray, who is also famous for writing The Bell Curve, a book that became notorious for saying that racial inequality is actually the result of inherent genetic inferiority in the case of minorities. I'm not saying this to necessarily discredit him. I only mention it because I think it's strange that Lauren Southern cites this book that barely mentions happiness to talk about happiness, when there's an entire genre of books that are dedicated to happiness and how to attain it. I mean, doesn't that seem strange to you? Thanks so much for watching all of that. If you liked it, please help us out by liking and subscribing. As you can see, we are a brand new channel and there's tons more stuff on the way. So if you want to see what else we'll be up to, just subscribe and hit the bell button as well. I'm super excited to be part of the conversation here and my next video will either be on Jordan Peterson or Star Wars memes. See ya.